hey everyone, I, I'm Seth. I'm a consultant at Data. And I'm Aaron. I'm Data's Chief Strategy Officer. So one of the great things about marketing is it, it can be fun. You know, I mean, you get design, you get to design cool stuff and try out new tech and get creative about coming up with ways to engage an audience. But but today we're going to talk about maybe one of the least exciting parts of marketing, and that's figuring out your budget. Seth, didn't we become consultants specifically so that we could get the project managers to do the budgeting part for us? <laughs> yeah, but unfortunately, some of the people listening today might not have a project manager on their team. So, and besides, this is, I mean, there's a lot of heavy strategic work that needs to go into figuring out an appropriate budget. Okay. And that actually leads to a, a question we get a lot, you know, what, what is a reasonable marketing budget for me? And like, I've seriously talked to marketers that have told me a straight face that the answer is 12%. Like that's the number, 12% of revenue. Uh, if you're under 12%, you're underfunding your marketing. If you're over 12%, you're wasting your money. I've also had marketers tell me that it has to be based on acquisition costs, right? You back it all out. You know, your close rate on new leads, your cost per lead. And then you calculate how much you have to spend on any given tactic to get one new customer. And anything not contributing to that direct customer acquisition can get cut. And that's perfect when you're talking about something like search engine marketing, but where does that leave something like your logo or the signage outside your building or a trade show display set up or, or even your website? You know, are, are you going to trace those marketing efforts that, that might cost tens of thousands of dollars directly back to a reasonable cost per acquisition? You know, everybody wants marketing to be this machine where you put a quarter in one end and you get 50 cents out the other side. And, and in reality, the stuff tends to just get messy. So there's definitely some validity to both examples though, right? Percent of revenue can sure give you a hint if something's way off and you should at least be making an effort to understand your cost per acquisition. But there's too many other variables to say that there's a fixed rule on how a marketing budget should be set. So what we wanna to do today is guide you through these variables and what we've seen from really hundreds of clients you know, over the last 10 years to help you gain a better understanding of how you should approach your marketing and your budget for your unique business. All right, here's the approach to budgeting that we recommend and that we'll talk about today. So number one, figure out what's really roughly normal for a business of your size and in your industry. And we'll talk about what to look for here. Second, be clear on what your high level business goals are. And we'll talk about how to use these goals to help prioritize the budget. Third, build your marketing wish list. With your goals in mind, what are all the things that you could do with marketing to help your business grow? Finally, and then kind of on repeat forever, prioritize and balance. You can't do it all. And balance is actually going to be achieved through constant evaluation and adjustment, not sitting at a status quo. We're going to do our best to make this webinar as interesting as a webinar about budgeting can reasonably be. We'll also have plenty of time at the end for questions and discussion. Well, and, and I want to call out the poll right now. So how did you get to your marketing budget today? We had... 40% say based on previous year's cost per acquisition. So they're doing some digging and trying to figure out real good numbers. We had 40% of people say percent of revenue. And we had 20% of respondents say, we don't know, which is okay. I mean, that's why we're here. Um, interested to hear during the Q&A what you all are doing. So we'll we'll get into that later. The first thing we need to look at is where your company stands today. And it's not all about revenue. You know, I mean, a, a young profitable software company in a competitive vertical with capital and minimal overhead and, and a large untapped total addressable market is likely looking to invest pretty heavily into sales and marketing. Whereas like, let's say a senior living community that's at or near capacity in a small town with, with little, no competition, they're going to spend proportionally less on marketing than, than that software company could, even, even if their revenue is similar. So we want to look at your business, but before we even take a look at goals, we want to look at your position as a company, right? Because that's going to be our first indicator of the level of aggression that you need to take with your marketing approach. So some of these are obvious here, like a company that's doing 500 million is going to have a, a lot different marketing budget than a, a company doing 500,000. But how about your, your growth trajectory? You know, if you're reliably growing at a rate of 40% a year, you might be willing to get more aggressive with your marketing budget than, than a company that's been pretty flat for the last 10 years. And, and similarly, if you're looking at friendly market conditions and demand seems to be in place to set you up for growth, that growth should be, should be factored into your marketing budget. How about profitability? All right, this is a huge factor that gets missed when you hear the things like, oh, 12% revenue. 
if you're selling large volume on razor thin margins, your marketing budget is probably going to be proportionally lower than a company selling of highly profitable subscription services. And, and finally, industry. That 12% of revenue might you know, very well be too high for a commodity product manufacturer selling B2B, but 12% is probably way too low if you're offering, let's call it B2C roofing services. And, and I've been speaking in pretty broad strokes, so let's take a look at how this actually shakes out in the real world. This data came from a HubSpot CMO survey, and, and it shows the percent of revenue spent on, on marketing by industry. And this might be a good gut check for you, but keep in mind here, there's a ton of other variables. So here it shows manufacturing at, at 3.75%, which that, that passes the smell test for me if we're looking at an average across all manufacturing. But again, you know, an old metal fab shop and a cutting edge medical device manufacturer are not the same, right? That medical device manufacturer might need to spend 10 or 20% or higher to be competitive. And that fab shop might be good at one or 2%. So that's always where these tables, that's always where I think these tables kind of fall short. And this is all before we've even talked about, you know, what you're actually trying to do with your marketing budget, which matters a whole lot more than what everybody else is spending on marketing. And, and I look at it like this, you know, quick check, am I way out of line with what others in my industry are doing? And if I am, is there a good reason for it? And so we're going to put out a poll here that you should all see, you know, our, are you aligned right now with, with the industry that you see in the chart? Are you higher or lower? Or do you kind of have no idea? So I think we can come back to this poll here in a few slides. All right. So a lot of us get into marketing because we love ideas and we tend to have a lot of them. But unfortunately, creative ideas are not what we ground a budget in. We start with the top level business goals, and then we see how marketing can contribute. And far too often, even marketers get caught up in thinking of marketing as just the promotional piece, and we forget the other three Ps. In reality, marketing should be very core to every company's strategies. And here are just a few examples of the kind of business goals that should be driving marketing budget decisions. For example, if you have growth targets. It's really critical to understand more than we want to grow 15% year over year for the next five years until we're at 5 million. That's a good beginning goal, but now we need to break it down and we need to talk about where that growth is going to come from and how profitable we expect that growth to be. So keep asking from where questions. For example, are you targeting new accounts? Or are you targeting new accounts in your existing markets? Are you targeting new accounts in your existing markets with your current service offerings? When it comes to that targeting, are you going to have to convert customers away from a competitor or do you have customers sitting out there potentially with no solution? One of those is going to be a lot less expensive. If someone's sitting out there with no solution and all you have to do is just go show them there's a better way, that will be much cheaper than the kind of advertising and promotion you're going to have to do to pull people away from a competitor. I mean, think about it. T-Mobile gives you a whole phone. Switching cost is expensive. So we really need to understand what, where is that growth driving from? And we don't want to forget our existing customers too. Your easiest form of growth is almost always going to come from making your current customers happier. So make sure that they have a place in your priorities and your company goals. You also want to think when it comes to new customers, are all new customers equally good to me? Like, will I take anyone? Or does my marketing budget need to help me shift upwards in the market? So these high-level strategic decisions on the positioning of your company in the years to come, we need to know those as we're building a marketing plan. And we really need to have a marketing strategy that connects the dots between your business goals and your final budget. And this is a living document. We're not going to etch it into a stone tablet and come down the mountain just in time for the board meeting. But if we don't have something like that for you to agree on with leadership, your marketing budget is like a cookie jar in a household of six kids. It is a race to the bottom and there will be crumbs left. So here's a practical example of how a difference in marketing strategy can drive different actions. So I'm working directly with a small company right now as their fractional CMO. Their current needs, you can see in the Venn diagram here, and then their future needs are listed under likely future state. It's very logical. So right now, they've been around for a little under a decade. They're very focused on sustainable growth, and they're very focused on providing a good work-life balance to their team. They're not going to sacrifice 
work-life balance for extreme growth. Their sales right now, as you would expect, are pretty much inbound from existing customers and referrals, but they're in an early stage where on that alone, they'll have good organic growth for probably another year or so. But they're thinking ahead. They have a high five-figure marketing budget, and they're strategically investing in marketing the brand to lay the foundation for that more aggressive sales growth in the future when you see promotional spend coming into the mix. So some of the priorities for their sales and marketing budget this year included things like, let's clean up the CRM. Let's really get it better integrated, have our sales flow in place, clean up our data structure. Let's have our product and solution offerings really well presented. We want to have it organized. We want to have photos. We want to have text we can use for them because we have broad, complicated offerings. We want to use that to develop really nice sales collateral that reflects our brand. And we want to redevelop our website to better portray the full breadth of our capabilities. So this year, our marketing spend is really focused on getting them to a level where they're portraying a sophisticated and mature brand presence that's going to put them on the same level as much larger and much more mature organizations within the same industry. And they're lucky because they've thought ahead and they're able to do this at a thoughtful pace. Way too many times I see people kind of kick those decisions down the line until they do have an urgent need when leads have dried up. And then they're struggling to catch up on all this work of having a sound foundation. So it's really important as you're thinking about business goals, don't get caught up in this trap of thinking of as marketing spent as just advertising dollars because you need to invest in long-term assets like your brand. So that, you know, now that you've gathered up you know, where you stand, what comparable companies might be spending, and, and you have an understanding of where you want to go, we want to take a look at how to get to a number for you. And, and I like to go through an exercise where we start wide. So here's everything we want to accomplish. That'd be your goals. And, and here's everything that we think could contribute to pushing us towards your goals. And when we start out, I, I don't want to be too worried about costs yet. Again, we're starting wide. And I, I asked this question, based on your goals, what would you do with unlimited time and resources? You know, maybe it's a, a high-end video shoot that shows off your product in action with testimonials. Maybe it's a new website that sets you up for future growth. Maybe it's a, a rebrand or you're finally pulling the trigger on that SEO work you've been saying you've been trying to prioritize eventually. Maybe it's a big national trade show or maybe a big community sponsorship or a podcast or whatever. The, this step, it, it's a nice opportunity for you to seek input from others in your company and hear other voices. So kind of ask that question. Our goals for the year are X, Y, and Z. You know, what marketing actions would you like to see if we had unlimited time and resources? And I mean, I don't think any, anyone here is an, an accountant, right? You're marketers. Uh, people generally like getting asked for their opinion on this kind of stuff. So compile that Compile the ideas into a list and, and keep it. It's never going to hurt you to have that list on hand. And, and having a, a nice repository of marketing ideas can save you a lot of time down the road. Uh, so with, with your goals in mind, I like to think of three buckets. And we want to try to start to bucket our options. And, and again, we're still at this stage not really worried about pricing yet or budget yet. Just what, what could contribute to your overall goals and what you think you could conceivably do this year. So on the left side, that's where you're probably going to see a lot of what you did last year. And if you just copy paste your budget, that's what you'll end up with. But when you look at everything that can contribute to your goals, you're probably going to see pretty quickly that some of last year's bucket items look a little out of place. Okay. And, and that middle bucket's where a lot of the new realistic ideas will get filled in. And, and this is where most of your decisions are going to have to be made. And then that last bucket on the right is there for future ideas. And in a lot of ways, it's just there to keep the middle bucket less overwhelming when you're ready to actually prioritize. Uh, we'll come back to these buckets here in a little bit when we talk about uh, narrowing it down. Like we said earlier, balance is not standing still. It's the action of constant evaluation and adjustment. And to give us a focus point, remember all that thinking we did about goals and our position in the market? You wanna keep that top of mind as you work through prioritization. That said, it doesn't mean that the top goal gets all the budget. That's the balance part. Similarly, we want to look at quick wins, must-haves, and keep in mind the slower paced execution that might be necessary as you work on larger strategic initiatives over a multi-year horizon. So depending on your level of experience, you might be able to guesstimate cost or labor fairly well. But oftentimes, you're going to need to get quotes from agencies or others to determine pricing for some of the items on your wish list. 
And this can get messy and confusing pretty fast because every vendor will price things slightly differently and have a slightly different idea of what you're asking for. And I'll dig into that a little bit more on the next slide. Based on this prioritization and guesstimates, it's a good idea to step back and get feedback at least once before finalizing. Make sure you're not including something that's just too out of left field. And don't lose track of those ideas that maybe didn't make that cut. Have a running list that you can refer to in future years when maybe your budget's more flexible. All right, so guesstimating can work for the rough outline of a budget, but you'll want to check your assumptions. I once volunteered with an aquarium keeping group, and this aquarium keeping group really wanted a new logo, but they didn't pursue it because they believed that a new logo would cost them $100,000. This belief was based on a volunteer's prior experience in the corporate world, where they had worked through some really large consumer-facing corporate rebrands, but because they never checked Fiverr, no new logo. I mean, $100,000 is a lot of guppies. Pricing also varies vastly depending on the vendor relationship that you have. So here at Data, we're very integrated and we're comprehensive in our approach. So when you ask for pricing, we come at you with 20 or more questions like the ones we're discussing today. We want to understand your goals so we can advise you appropriately. But if you're working with an hourly rate outsourcer who doesn't put any emphasis on strategy and mostly works around projects, they're just going to want detailed specs. And the quality of the project is largely going to depend on the labor you put into it. So it's always good to shop around, but you really have to be cognizant that it's not always possible to get apples to apples pricing. And if you're not careful, this can be the stage that dreams die at. So be ready to do some iteration on what exactly you want. Maybe you had this idea for a great video shoot, but when you talk to the videographer, you find out, oh, we can't get an on-location video shoot with special effects and actors. That's 30K. But we can do something that achieves the same goal at 3K. It's just lower production value or faster to make. So the expensive experts who do a lot of discovery are going to be better at ideating and advising your end goal, and you should get their advice wherever you can. They'll be able to lay out your options and tell you the pros and cons of each approach. Right. So let's get to actually pr prioritizing your activities and in, again, going back to these buckets. So that left bucket there, that, that's where your total marketing budget's going to come out, right? So the totals for the other two buckets don't really matter. Most of what you're going to be doing at this point is moving items in and out of that left bucket and, and rolling up to a total. Now, obviously this this view way oversimplifies what you're doing, right? And you should have a lot more information on projected impact of each activity and you need to take it all into consideration. But in order to juggle everything and not completely throw away ideas, it's really nice to have it simplified, right? So look at what you landed on, on that left bucket. And does it line up with the level of aggression needed to reach your goals? I mean, the last thing you wanna do at this point is set yourself up for failure to, to hit your marks. So, and then from here, it really depends on your goal or your role and how your company's organized, but you're going to want to put together a, a mapped out plan with a timeline that shows what all is included in that marketing budget and what you expect for impact and results. So you could be looking at, you know, maybe it's metrics like a number, a certain number of marketing qualified leads or a certain website traffic number, or results could look like we finally untangled our brands and set ourselves up for future success. There's different outcomes and impact that you want to make depending on what ends up going in that left bucket. So you can DIY it or you can lean on a, a full service marketing partner to help you. If you are a marketing director and you need to get budget approved, do your best to present a compelling case, uh, but expect some push and pull. Okay, the buckets give you an easy way uh, to come back and pull out lower priority items if necessary uh, so you can save them for later. So now that I've covered some of the ways that you can sort this all out, Aaron is going to take you through what you need to look out for. I think between Seth and I, we've got about two decades worth of conversations about marketing budgets. So here's some of the reoccurring hurdles that we see teams getting caught up in. So number one, and we stress this a little bit, don't expect to set it and forget it. Again, standing still and balancing are very different things. You want to give yourself wiggle room because the only constant in life is change. Similarly, Remember to be critical of what you did last year. Like Seth said, don't just copy and paste the budget. This one's really important. Don't look to marketing to solve serious core business problems. If you have serious production flaws or your sales team is non-existent or your customer support team speaks mostly in four-letter words, marketing can never be more than lipstick on a pig. 
Long term, there won't be an IROI. You have to fix the core of your business first and then apply marketing to help. Don't give in to the temptation to go big or go home. It is absolutely fine to start small and crawl, walk, run. There's many different ways to think about scaling down from limiting geography to doing a pilot project to A-B testing and beyond. And a good professional will help lay out your options and explain those different approaches and what you would get or sacrifice with each approach. And then finally, really make sure that your marketing efforts are taking into account the entirety of your customer's journey, not just the upper portion of the funnel where you're trying to get them to be a hot lead. The customers you have today are a super valuable source of future revenue. You need to budget for them in your marketing spend. We don't want to love bomb. We want to embrace them for their whole lifetime with us. All right. So to recap here, here's the process. You want to start by understanding your position, your goals. So know the why behind the budget to try to get an understanding of the level of aggression it's going to take to get you where you want to go. And then you need to create the plan and the corresponding budget by starting wide and then narrow down your list based on priorities. Don't ever throw away any ideas, okay? The buckets will come in handy down the road and, and ex accept that you might need some wiggle room and plans can change, okay? You, like Aaron said, you can't set it and forget it and your buckets will likely see movement throughout the year because priorities naturally shift because they always do. With that, I wanna hit on the last poll question we threw out there. Are you aligned with industry standards for budget? And if you remember, right, this was like that second slide we showed where it was, I'm pretty close. I'm higher than industry standard for my marketing budget. I'm lower and I have no idea. No idea caught 60% of the responses. So if you have no idea where you stand relative to your industry, you are not alone. It looks like more than half of the people on, the, on this webinar. And then the other 40% say they were lower. So they were lower than the industry standard from the HubSpot CMO survey. All right. At this point, I think we can turn it over to you all. So what questions do we have? Zoe, do we have any roll in while we were presenting? We did not. Yeah, feel free. You can use the chat. You can use the q and It looks like we have one. We got one in. So I'm trying to prioritize my marketing for the next year. The exec team is focused on some flashier tactics that seem cool. I want to prioritize what I know works. What should I do? And what are these flashy tactics? Like they want to do TikTok dances or something? You, you've you seen this before, Aaron, right? It's like the, few oh, times. I gotta be careful what I say, but like the CEO like the gets CEO sold on gets something them. and they push it downhill to marketing and say, we need to do this. It's tough. And like the, sometimes the internal conversations get challenging. And I think what might work the best in this case is to maybe look at scale testing. You know, if it's, maybe there's a way you can just test, if it's a campaign, let's say, just test it in one state, you know, with all the, all the other parameters that you want to do for, if you were to scale it up nationally, or maybe it's like in one city, depending on what type of company you're with. But I think the key here is to test it prove it out and then either show yourself or the, you know, the executive team that it works or it doesn't. Kind of in tandem with that, if this sort of thing is coming up a lot and you're getting ideas repeatedly that just aren't a fit, like if you're getting, let's say you're a B2B accounting firm and people keep saying, maybe we should do more braid floats. That could work, but the fact that it's a less effective tactic and it doesn't feel as strategically targeted, that might mean that you have a deeper miscommunication or misunderstanding within your leadership team too. So this is where that importance of having a strategy written out that everybody's on the same page with, that really gives you a tool to keep everyone kind of accountable on the same page. So when someone says, hey, my buddy who runs a drop shipping website said that he was able to growth hack with this one weird stunt. You can say, well, given our audience, our goals and our positioning, this sort of thing makes sense. But this one, you know, maybe, maybe not as much sense. So really make sure that don't always gloss over those things too fast. Consider if there's maybe a larger strategic gap there. And it looks like we have a few other questions here. So Marty, great to see you again, Marty. What presentation platform would we recommend, Excel or PowerPoint? Um, 
presentation. Do you mean like Google Sheets or Google Slides versus PowerPoint? Honestly, if you can get it and you're already operating on Windows as a company, I would just go with Microsoft um, because we are a marketing agency and we all are on cute little Macs. We use the Google Suite, but you get what you pay for. Microsoft is better and you will just have more options across the board if you're in Microsoft. Like Slides works, but there's a lot of funky. Yeah. I think you can also always consider like a Miro or, oh, what's that fun one? Zoe, do you know what I'm talking about? The one that zooms in and out? Seth, you look like you're thinking about it. I know. I can I can picture the one. I'm a bit, I like Miro. Yeah. Preferably not Excel, I would say. But, <laughs> right. yeah. but slides or, or PowerPoint are, are awesome. PowerPoint, yeah. You'll just get more features. It's more powerful and more standard. Well, and I would say too, the biggest thing would just be, you know, refining the content that you're presenting to the platform's not always going to matter, but the quality of it and just yeah. ensuring that depending on the context that whatever you're doing is engaging and those sort of things that that would be the biggest thing as well. That's a good point. It's not all about the gadgets. All right. And then Caleb asked, how about for a nonprofit organization? that are a part of a larger nonprofit umbrella, but give the nonprofits under the umbrella individualism to run on their own, but have very limited budget. Hopefully that makes sense. It does. And your challenge will be that you probably have to work with the board a lot of the times. So that strategy piece and connecting the dots between what we want to achieve and what we're budgeting for is going to have to be really spelled out. Um, limited budget is hard. Most vendors will give you somewhat of a break because of the nonprofit thing. They'll probably knock, I don't know, five to 10% off stuff. But I think the biggest thing that I see with nonprofits, the hard part is realism. You have X budget, you can achieve X goals. So don't set goals that you can't achieve with your budget. The other part of it is think outside of the, the successful nonprofits that I see have outsized results with their marketing are the ones who are really good at partnerships and getting innovative with the connections they have. It's not that they're spending more, it's that they're making use of the community connections and the organizations that they're integrated with or that they partner well with. I don't know, Seth, what would you add to that? Yeah, I think that last bit you said, I mean, you gotta do, you typically end up having to do a lot with a little. And the the good news with most of these nonprofits, it's a you know you're you're doing something that people care about and want to support, so lean into that. And the other thing too with working with boards, it can be tricky, but you know pick pick that one board member that you know is going to give you the most pushback and and really get all those objections from them up front, and then get to be best friends with them, and give them a little extra attention. And but yeah, that's a it's always a little bit tough when you're in that position. Right. Seth, I think I'll let you take the next one from Caleb. This has been a great presentation. Thank you. It's all Seth's fault. How can data help with marketing? How can data help with marketing? Well, data is a, a full service for actual marketing firm, right? I mean, businesses hire data in the same way they would, you know, go out and hire on staff marketing team to take ownership of everything from the, the strategy to the execution to the analysis. It starts with a conversation usually 30 minute conversation to see, you know, what are you, what are you looking for? And, and would data be a fit? Could we help you? And then if, if it makes sense and we kind of mutually decide that we want to go down this path, uh, then we move into what we call a, an assessment. It's a 90 minute session. We try to bring you as much value as we can and bring you a lot of insights while uh, we're uh, asking a whole bunch of questions about where you want to go and what you're doing now. So that's what that path looks like. Anything to add to that, Aaron? I don't think you covered it. I can quickly show just a quick slide that kind of overviews the breadth of our services. And then Caleb also asked, what does fractional mean? Seth, you want to? Uh, okay. We've, uh, yeah, we've seen a trend over the last several years toward hiring fractional talent. So sometimes you'll hear like a, you'll hire a fractional CFO rather than going on finding a really, really expensive CFO. You don't need all of their time, but you want somebody really, really good for a fraction of their time. And we've taken that same concept and applied it to marketing strategy and execution. So 
So our clients get a fractional team, which basically gives them all the power of a full-scale marketing team with campaign specialists and people who know how to install Google Tag Manager and people who are great at developing websites. But instead of paying the cost of a full team, they pay for a fraction of that team's time. So every time you're getting the full expertise without the FTE price tag, essentially. All right. Great questions. Thank you, everyone.